Hi, this is Phil Kopman with a tutorial on unit testing. We've covered requirements and design, and now we'll be talking about unit test, which is a way to check to make sure the detailed design and the implementation turned out as you expected. Unit testing involves testing a single subroutine, procedure, method, or other standalone chunk of code. It uses a low-level interface, so you can think of unit as being a code module. Here's an example of a subroutine that takes two inputs and produces one output. A unit test would test several combinations of inputs, for example, a equals zero and b equals zero is one unit test, and a equals negative one, b is plus one is a different unit test. The results of a unit test are checked against some oracle, something that says this is what it should be. For this function, the two inputs being zero is supposed to result in zero, and negative one and plus two are supposed to result in plus one. If those results match the expected values, then the unit test passes. Unit tests should include both structure and functionality. Structure are white box tests, functionality are black box tests, and we'll talk about both of those. Unit testing is your best chance to catch boundary-based bugs and other bugs due to slight imperfections in how the code was implemented. It is going to be much easier to find those sorts of bugs here in unit test than at the system testing level. There are three anti-patterns for unit testing. One anti-pattern is not doing it. Some systems are only tested at the system level, and that's a lost opportunity to find many detailed bugs that will not be found in most system testing, but could have been found in unit testing. Another anti-pattern is testing only happy paths. It's common to see unit tests that just confirm what the programmer expected to see, instead of really trying to delve down into all the deep dark corners of the way the code was written. A subtle but critical anti-pattern is forgetting to test missing code. Sometimes there are pieces of code that should be there that aren't. And if you look at the code and say, well, we're gonna just test based on what's in the code, you won't ever think of those sorts of things such as exception handlers or missing special conditions because they're not in the code and it didn't occur to you to test things that you're not looking at in the code. There are two different generic approaches to doing testing. One is black box testing. Black box testing uses test design based on knowledge of the behavior of the software, but not the detailed implementation. It is often called functional or behavioral testing. The idea is to test the what, but not the how. As an example, if you have an automotive cruise control, that system might behave differently at different speeds. A black box test might try different various speeds and different control combinations but would have no idea if there are special cases inside the code that handle things. It might hit them, it might not. The advantage to a black box test is it can be written only based on the requirements or design. You don't need to know what's inside the code. You can just say, gee, does this thing do more or less what it's supposed to? Another advantage is that sometimes looking at the code makes you think a certain way, and black box testing is not subject to that particular bias. The disadvantage of black box testing is that it can be difficult to exercise all the code paths because you don't really know what's going on inside the code. You just know at the high functional level, you seem to be hitting all the high level requirements. At the unit testing level, black box testing looks like basing tests on the detailed design. This means you would look at the flowchart or state chart and design tests just looking at the flowchart and state chart and confirm that the software behaves the way the design says it should. The other general approach to testing is white box testing. In white box testing, the designer has knowledge of how the software is actually written. That means you're actually looking at the code when you design the white box tests. White box testing is often called structural testing or sometimes glass box or clear box testing but white box testing is the preferred term. The idea is to exercise software knowing how it is written. Back to the cruise control automotive example, a white box test would look at all the lines of code and make sure that all the paths in the code are exercised. And if there's a lookup table, 
make sure that every entry in the lookup table has been tested, knowing exactly where the boundaries are between when each entry in the table would be applied. An advantage to white box testing is that it helps get high structural code coverage. Black box testing struggles to hit all the lines of code because it's operating blindfolded. With white box testing, if you miss a line of code, you can say, oh, there's a line of code I need to test. Let me think about how to get at that line of code. The good news is, with white box testing, you can get at all the lines of code because you get to see what's going on. An important disadvantage, though, is that you don't necessarily test code that's missing. What do I mean by missing code? Well, let's say there's a special case you should handle. If that special case is not in the code at all, nothing in the code will tell you you should be testing for it. That means that black box and white box testing both have their roles, and you should be using both of them for unit testing. As with all testing, the concept of coverage is key. Coverage is a metric for how thorough your testing is. Getting high coverage can be difficult. Think of it as trying to paint a wall. Painting the wide open middle, pretty straightforward, takes a few roller strokes. Getting into the nooks and crannies in the corners, that's a little bit more delicate work, takes more time, takes more attention. Coverage metrics tend to reflect this. The simplest, coarsest metric for unit testing is function coverage. How many functions in your system did you test at all? If you never even tried to test half the functions, well, that's probably not very thorough testing, is it? Once you've gotten to the point where most or all of the functions have been tested at least a little, a finer grain notion of coverage is statement coverage. What fraction of the code statements have been tested? Did you actually execute every line of code at least once? A typical metric here might be that you've tested 95% of the lines of code. Well, 95% sounds good, but that means 5% of the codes in your system have never been executed at all. And depending on your system, that could be a problem. Once you've executed all the lines of code, there are still better types of coverage metrics available. The next one is branch coverage, also called path coverage. In branch coverage, you say, all right, I've executed all the lines of code, but did I try each branch both ways? This one's a little subtle. If you have an if-else statement, then 100% statement coverage means you also got 100% branch coverage because you must have done both the if and the else. But branch coverage also includes the notion that if you have an if without an else, did you do both the if and did you also do the if being false, which skips the code? If you missed the skipping the code, you still might have 100% statement coverage, but you'd be missing that half of the branch coverage for that if statement. An even finer grain notion of control flow coverage is MCDC coverage, which we'll handle in the next slide. Getting to 100% coverage can be a bit tricky. If you have error handlers for errors that are never supposed to happen, you can't get 100% coverage unless you make that error happen. Now you might say, well, it's never supposed to happen, so what's the big deal? Well, the counter to that is, if you have an error handler that you've never actually tested, how do you know it's going to work if that error actually occurs? you need to find some test method to exercise the handler to make sure it really works. Another issue with 100% code coverage is dead or unused code. And usually there, what you should be doing is, if that code cannot ever be executed, why is it there? Probably you should take it out. An even more sophisticated type of coverage is MCDC coverage for white box testing. MCDC is Modified Condition Decision Coverage. It's used by DO-178 for critical aviation software testing and is commonly used for other safety critical applications where you have to be really sure the code's always going to work and do exactly the right thing or else somebody could die. MCDC coverage exercises all the ways to reach all the code. The criteria for MCDC coverage are that every entry and exit point is invoked, Every decision tries every possible outcome. Each condition in a decision generates all the outcomes. And each condition in a decision is showed to independently affect the outcome of the decision. That's quite a lot to take in, but the idea is, in branch coverage, you do the if and the else. But in MCDC coverage, if there's five different ways the if could be true, you need to try all five different ways and then also show the else could happen. As an example, the condition clause if A is equal to 3 or B is equal to 4 
For branch coverage, you just need to test that it was true and that it was false. For MCDC coverage, you have to say, well, if A is 3 and B is not 4, then we know A activates the true statement. If A is not equal to 3 and B is 4, then we know that B can activate the true statement. And if both A is not equal to 3 and B is not equal to 4, we know that the else can be activated even if it's just a fall through. Now, while it seems like almost everything has to be tried, you do not have to try A is 3 and B is 4 because that's already been covered by the first two cases. If you're not quite sure, go look at the list at the top of the four decision criteria and convince yourself the first three test cases check all the boxes and the fourth one is not needed. For simple ands and ors, you generally need one more test than the number of terms in the condition clause. For two terms, you need three tests. For five terms, you need six tests, and so on. If you have more complicated expressions, there's a truth table technique that can help, and you may need trial and error to find all the different variations. The next item in the playlist is a video from another author which works a truth table example for MCDC coverage. There are a number of other possible considerations when considering unit testing coverage. A common criteria for good unit tests is to exercise boundaries, known as boundary testing. Boundary testing probes the borders of behavioral changes. As examples, if you have a minimum acceptable value, you would check one notch below the minimum, exactly at the minimum, and one notch above the minimum to make sure there's no unexpected results. That includes minimum and maximum values, things like counter rollovers, wraparounds, overflows, and those sorts of things. A special category of boundary tests that is important in practice are time crossings. Hours crossing midnight, days crossing the end of the month, leap years, leap days, years rolling over from 1999 to 2000, and so on. A different type of unit testing coverage that also matters for robust systems is handling exceptional values. Every time there's a floating point computation, ask yourself what happens if a not a number or an infinity is pulled into the equation. For pointers, ask what happens if there's a null pointer that's dereferenced. For string operations, ask what happens if there's a null string or a string with no terminating character. Other exceptional values include undefined inputs or invalid inputs or unusual events such as leap year or daylight savings time changes. In other words, exceptional value testing is both control flow but also, often more importantly, special data values that are not the normal expected values but which can still happen and cause your software to misbehave. When you think you're done unit testing, you should be able to justify your level of coverage. Is your software good enough if you only get statement coverage? Or do you need MCDC coverage? And did you cover all the special cases? Did you cover all the potential data issues? Did you look for divide by zero? And so on. It's important to define a strategy not only for structural and behavior coverage, but also for boundary and exception coverage to get good, thorough unit testing. While you can do your own unit testing from the ground up, it's smart to use a unit testing framework if one is available in your development environment. CUnit is a classic example framework, although it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as it suits your purposes. In CUnit, there's a test registry which contains a number of test suites, and a test suite is a set of related test cases. A test case is a procedure that runs one or more executions of a module for the purpose of testing. Typically, it's better if a test case has either one case or a number of variations on a very narrow theme to keep things consistent within the test case. An assertion is a statement that determines if a test has passed or failed. Remember that just exercising the software isn't good enough. You have to also know that the test passed by comparing the output values to see if they're what's expected. As an example of a test case, let's consider you have a function that takes two integers and returns the maximum. You would define test maxi with the test underscore part being there to help the framework know that these two routines correspond to each other. Test maxi is a test case and it has three different assertions in it. CU, standing for C unit assert, is true if the logical relation is true and false if it's not. The test passes if it's true. The test fails if it's false. 
And here we say the max of 0 and 2 should be 2, the max of 0 and negative 2 should be 0, and the max of 2 and 2 should be 2. In practice, a CUNIT test looks like long lists of CU asserts or other similar assertions, and inside the assertion is a test that sends inputs to the unit you're trying to test and then checks for the expected output. Here are some best practices for unit testing. You should unit test every module in your system. Use a high coverage combination of white box and black box testing, ideally with a fairly granular coverage metric such as MCDC coverage or branch coverage. Use a unit testing framework such as CUnit and break tests up into fairly small chunks so it's easy to understand what each test does and you can be sure that you did all the things you intended to do in terms of different types of coverage. Don't forget to not only get control flow coverage, which is what those metrics were about, but also good data value coverage, such as validating all lookup table entries, checking for divide by zeros, checking for unusual exceptional data values, and so on. There are a number of pitfalls to unit testing. Creating test cases is a development effort. It takes significant resources, and guess what? Test cases can also have bugs. So a failed test case could be a bug in the code, but it could also be a bug in the test case. Nonetheless, it's important to do the test cases to make sure that your code is as thoroughly debugged as possible before you begin more integrated system-level testing. If you've written code that is difficult to test, it can lead to dysfunctional unit test strategies. For example, sometimes people put their system into a breakpoint debugger, take the entire source code image, and try and do unit testing with a breakpoint debugger. That is not an effective unit test strategy. If that's the only way to run your functions, then you should probably redesign to make unit tests more feasible. Similarly, just because you're using CUnit doesn't mean you're doing unit testing. Using CUnit to test a 100,000 line blob of code, well, that is a sort of testing, but you're not gonna get very good coverage and it's not really what we meant by unit testing. If you use only white box testing, it is doomed to succeed. And by that, I mean there are tools that will automatically generate tests that cover all your lines of code. But those tools have no way of knowing what the values are supposed to be, unless you feed them additional information. And they're not going to generate code you forgot to put in, such as missing special cases. Finally, do not substitute unit testing for peer reviews and static analysis. You should be doing peer reviews, you should be doing static analysis, and unit testing should come after the code looks clean from both of those methods.